I'm Father. And this is Dave. And this yeah. is Text Trek. Engage. talking about some Star Trek Discovery news today. Right. The leaks are starting to come fast and furious. There's got to be a trailer, right? Eventually. They're going to hold off on that because it sounds like we're not getting the show until later in the year. Uh, we'll get to... Um, it's going to be 2018, isn't it? No. But uh, we, we do have some info on the release, actually, that we'll be getting to in a little bit. But okay. we'll go ahead and start with the, the really big news that everyone's talking about. Right. That is the new cast additions, uh, Jason Isaacs and uh, Mary Wiseman. You know him as uh, Filmdom's uh, Harry Potter's, uh, or Lucius Malfoy's dad. I, I don't know him as that, because I don't No, you know him as Lucius Harry Malfoy. Potter. Jeez, I'm screwed, I completely screwed that up. He's Draco Malfoy's dad, Lucius Malfoy. He's evil dad with long blonde Thor hair. Well, I'm sure that's cool, but... What uh, do you to, know him from, fathery? Well, to me, he's going to be Captain Lorca, uh, commander of the USS Discovery. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do know him from, I guess most recently, he's the Grand Inquisitor on Star Wars Rebels. Okay. Uh, yeah. he, he's done some uh, voice acting. He's He's been in a lot of the uh, DC animated movies as uh, nothing but villains. Uh, Sinestro, Rachel Ghoul, Lex Luthor... Um, that's, that's honestly a pretty badass lineup of villainy. <laughs> yeah, well, those are like the three biggest assholes in the DC universe. And, and he's got, like, I think, quintessential evil British guy voice. Absolutely. Uh, his, the, his other role that people might have seen that in the sort of pop culture out there is uh, British commander in The Patriot. Mm -hmm. Mel Gibson's highly historically accurate uh, portrayal of uh, revolution, uh, Revolutionary War America. And again, he's just like the most evil fuck that the United States yep. has ever fought. Yep. I, I still remember like the trailers for that. Even the trailers were funny where he's like, he's like, the rules of warfare do not apply here yeah. or something like that. Um, he's done a lot of military stuff though. He's also in Black Hawk Down. Okay. Uh, he was in uh, a Fury from a couple years ago. Yeah, yeah. Um, so he... He's got kind of a like a chiseled, scary, a little bit scary looking face. Uh, but he does have like this this presence that he brings. Yep. That um, I'm I'm guessing he's a classically trained British actor. So yep. uh, they they go with those types a lot in Star Trek. I I don't know if he's going to be another evil bad guy, and we're gonna have a bad captain, or if maybe. He will. And if once a, a British person might not be like they are in Star Wars. <laughs> well. Captain Picard was played by a British guy. It's true, but uh, he might—they might want just this guy with that military, that commander presence uh, right. as the captain. Right. If um, if um, who's our lead? What's what's the character's name? Uh, Lieutenant Commander Rainsford. Rainsford. Or number one. Number one. Yeah. If if number one has like sort of a you know a higher degree of empathy or you know interfaces better with people, I can see how that might make her an easier counterpoint if he's kind of brusque. Yeah, Picard was brusque when they when they began, and, yeah. and even actually throughout the whole series, he was somewhat always uh, registered as that. And I could see them kind of doing a, like a uh, Captain uh, Jellico, um, yeah, the guy who took over the Enterprise in, in season five when Picard was messing around with the Cardassians. Yep. Um, and he doesn't get along with the crew. Although if he's calling her number one, I'm thinking that they have some kind of rapport. Some, right, because that's an, of, that's an uh, informal affection. sort yeah. of thing. Yeah, you wouldn't say that to like, oh, I hate this crew under me. They're they're terrible at everything. Number one, maybe, that's your nickname. Maybe every time he says it, he's like, can you come over here? Number one. <laughs> uh, he's real sarcastic about it all the time. The, the main thing is we we just don't know. 
I, I'm thinking at some point he will lose command and uh, Rainsford will step up, but we will uh, wait and right. see. Uh, I, I think this is really good casting, though. Um, I, I like it, too. It's some uh, some of like the most exciting casting that we've heard so mm -hmm. far. Yeah, he will for sure, um, I think, along with Michelle Yeoh as captain of the other ship, have presence on mm -hmm. screen. And then the, the other uh, cast addition that we have is Mary Wiseman, mm -hmm. who will be playing a Starfleet cadet named Tilly. I'm not sure if that is a first name or last name. Sounds like it could go either way. Yep. Um, she's completing her last year of the Academy by doing field training on board the USS Discovery. Does that, um, like, I, I am woefully ignorant of, of real-world military stuff. Do people complete Academy training on, like, if not warships, then on, like, you know, mission-based, you know, uh, naval vessels and things like that? I don't think so, but I'm not sure, but I there is a precedence in Star Trek to do that. Sure, sure. Uh, most notably being Wesley Crusher from The Next Generation. Right. Um, I mean, I like, the, you know, the interesting, these can be the eyes eyes on characters. Uh, of course, a lot of people thought Wesley was kind of the annoying, you know, smart-ass kid thing. Um, and, and I think handled a little bit more strongly uh, that, 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 that you could have a better introductory character or just, just an interesting younger voice character. And uh, I, I don't know this actor actress from from anything. Oh well, she's very young and very unknown. She uh, graduated from Juilliard in 2015, and the only thing I could find out about her is she's done some stage work in New York, and just last year started doing some TV uh, work, including a show called uh, Longmire. She was on a few episodes. All oh, right, of that. I've heard of it. I, I hadn't heard Registers. of it. Registers. Yeah. Um, I think it's got a following. I think it's supposed to be good. As far as the character, though, uh, we can speculate on that. Uh, knowing that we're going to have this uh, higher-ranking uh, lieutenant commander as the main character, mm -hmm. I'm wondering if they might have some kind of uh, relationship between them, maybe like a mentor, okay. protege type thing. Sure. I could also see them doing that with Rainsford and the higher-ranking uh, Michelle Yao on the, the Shenzhou. Mm -hmm. Um I don't know, maybe it's like a, a three levels of, of uh, mentorship. Men mentordom? Are you saying that just because they're women that there's going to need the mentoring? No, I'm saying that... Can they be mentoring when... with any other given character? Sure, why not? <laughs> Sex bastard. <laughs> but on the gender note, yeah. we do know that there is a young man, mm -hmm. uh, Ensign Connor, on board the other ship, the Shinzu. Okay. Uh, both these people will probably be around the same age. So, possible uh, romantic fling there. Right. It'll be interesting, whenever they do get into that, and that could be from right from the first episode, or that could be something that slowly develops, it's going to show up at some point. I'll be curious to see how they handle it. Um, I don't know that... Um, I, I've ever felt that Trek is really at its strongest with relationships. Um they, they sometimes read a little flat to me, uh, and uh, there's 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 ones I like on, on Trek and, and ones that I'm not wild about. I just never thought that their writing, like, sparkled at that. There's, I would say there's good examples and bad examples, um, but uh, maybe maybe we should go into, like, the full list uh, as a topic uh, yeah, at another yeah. point. Yeah, I think this would be a good good idea. See what which ones are the best ones, which ones are the tawdriest ones. <laughs> but just uh, going over the entire cast that we have now, this brings a total of uh, 13. I believe we have uh, nine Starfleet officer, uh, officers between mm -hmm. the two ships, mm -hmm. uh, three Klingons, and one Vulcan ambassador who happens to be Spock's daddy. So that's a total of 13. So we... And we don't know quite what role the Klingons will play. Right, yeah. We don't We've know... seen the conceptual crypt uh, <laughs> ship or whatever art that may or may not have may, anything yeah. to do with reality. Um, but, but for sure Klingons are going to have a role. Yeah, but they were talking about Klingons so early. Uh, I'm expecting them to be uh, at the least heavily reoccurring. Uh, kind of like how the villains on Deep Space Nine were handled. Gold, Gold Ducat shows mm -hmm. up multiple times a season. Uh, or possibly they'll be in every episode or damn near every episode. Mm -hmm. um, telling one serialized story over 13 episodes would, would definitely uh, 
you know, cause like, Game of Thrones type situations where you have a large cast and, mm. and they're frequently checked up on. You know, you cut from one character to another right. character to sure. another in different places. So maybe the Klingons will be used in that capacity. You ever seen um, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid? Yeah. Uh, you know the part where they're being pursued by that posse or whatever, and like every few days they realize that they're still following him, and they're like, who are these guys? I kind of want to see a season of that where they're just like on the run for whatever reason, and they're like, we cannot shake these freaking Klingons. Well, hopefully it has a better ending that will lead to a season <laughs> two. <laughs> if it does, but if it goes poorly, that's a, that's a badass way to go out. That could just be. Just a thought, just a thought. And then we get a, a brand new cast in the, uh, the next uh, season. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, but uh, on that note, uh, Les Moonves, the CEO of CBS, mm-hmm. who is, I guess, the the authority on anyone working on Star Trek Discovery. Mm-hmm. He's the final, uh, the, the buck stops with him as far as you okay. know, what choices to make. Possibly had a conflict with Brian Fuller. That's rumors. We don't know if that was true, if that's mm-hmm. why Fuller left the show. Um, he did speak at an investors event last week, mm-hmm. and he said that he expects after Discovery launches, CBS All Access uh, will reach up to 4 million subscribers. Interesting. And that's not just banking on Discovery. That sounds, but, that sounds big. Yeah, I mean, if you look at, just to put that in a frame of reference, like a show like The Flash on CW, mm-hmm. that gets... Uh, Probably around four million viewers an episode. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you're, you're four million on, paying uh, subscribers, yeah, but they're going to have other content besides Discovery, right? Um, we should actually, you know, who we should ask about his opinion on that? Yeah, would be Randy. Yeah, yeah, my uh, the the store owner at Rogues Gallery where I work. He would. Uh, I, I I'd be curious to ask him what he thought about that because he's a, a big TV guy. But yep. Um, I mean, that sounds like something you might tell your investors, by the way, that may not sure, yeah. fully accurately reflect reality. Um, you know, I've always sort of helped it, or felt and hoped that they so need this to be a flagship series that it has to be good. And They're putting so much money in it. Right. And they have Netflix giving them money to put into it. Oh, right. I forgot but, that. Um, What's Netflix get out of that? Well, Netflix has all the distribution outside of the United States. Right, right. That's and, how they're going to get it, like, earlier or whatever. Right. Yeah. And and I don't know if it's been said how much money comes from Netflix, how much money comes from CBS themselves, mm-hmm. but they're spending 6 to $7 million on an episode. Wow. And that's, like, what the budget was for Game of Thrones in Season 1. Yeah. When they had to build the Stark's castle in, in Winterfell and in all the sets. And I don't know if, I don't think we've talked about this, but I will be interested just to see, you know, the kid in me especially will be interested just to see how that translates into cool ship stuff. Like, are there battles going to be filmed more like, uh, like the, um, you know, the Abrams, uh, movies, uh, have been the, uh, you know, are they going to stick with kind of more of a classic thing, you know, um, uh, prime universe approach? Um, and you mean as far as like the execution of a battle, if it's sure. more like a very kinetic and high, you know, I mean, y- like even a Star the... Wars type space battle versus uh, like a World War Two on ships right. firing big guns. I mean, at each even other. even throughout, you know, like DS Nine and stuff, I saw enough to see that, and or you know, like anybody who saw like First Contact or the Battle with the Borg and all that stuff mm. has seen that they will sometimes do these pretty fast moving battles. Yeah, um, uh, I, I would, I honestly. But there's a part of me that likes those, and there's a part of me that kind of wishes that it was all like Wrath of Khan, but just with more big ships and stuff, so kind of more slow moving. But um, Wrath of Khan had like no money. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and you know, I, I think a lot of that. I mean, James Horn did such an amazing score, and it was so well edited and everything. But I will say, I like there's parts that there's parts of of the um, uh, what do they call the Abrams verse? I can't remember. The Kelvin timeline. The Kelvin timeline. There's parts of the Kelvin timeline uh, action stuff that I liked. And I'm just diverting here. Uh, just something to talk about in the future or to, to guess at. It'll be interesting to talk about certainly when we see some clips of it. Uh, he did also say at this event that he's expecting Discovery to uh, finally come out in late summer or early fall. Mm-hmm. 
And also in some confirmation along those lines, or semi-official confirmation, there is a uh, Twitter handle called Stella the Star Trek Dog, which claims to be Nicholas Meyer's dog, uh -huh. and often provides insight into the Discovery uh -huh. writer's room. Yep. And Stella the Star Trek Dog posted this picture on Twitter that was uh, quickly uh, taken down. Okay. But it would seem to imply that the a release date the show is is coming out in August. The the picture is just a, a post-it note with the word August written on it. It is certainly pregnant with meaning and the kind of thing where if it was not the case, I mean I guess they could always blame it on that dumb dog. <laughs> but uh, Ultimate but I think though. people might might be a little little saddened or angered if that was dropped without any meaningfulness. Yeah. My birthday is in September. So if they have to bump it back a month, they can, but it has to come out in September. Well, Just I, let, I'm hope, letting you know, CBS. Yeah, I hope treat you me. have a, a happy birthday. <laughs> yeah, with, with Star Trek. Yeah. Uh, just one other side note: at the same in, uh, event, this investors event, um, the new CEO of Viacom was there, uh, Robert Backish, who. Uh -huh. Uh, there's been some shuffling around with Viacom and Paramount had a uh, less than uh, what they were expecting type of year okay. in 2016. Yeah, yeah. So they're looking for a new CEO for Paramount, which will be important for Star Trek movies and the Kelvin movies mm -hmm. if they're going to make any more. But the, the new CEO of Viacom, the parent company of, of Paramount, mm -hmm. he said that they, uh, he was talking about how Paramount is committing to uh, 15 movies a year, and uh, they're going to be a little bit more selective, but it's still going to include their big tentpole films. The examples he cited was Transformers, Mission Impossible, and Star Trek. Okay. So he's still thinking of Star Trek. And if you look at the last 10 years or so, um, pretty much every year Paramount releases a Transformers, Star Trek, or Mission Impossible movie mm -hmm. in the summer. So they kind of you know expect to have that that big summer blockbuster, sure. which the Kelvin movies are in right or wrong. That's what they're intended uh, to be. What was the last one called? Star, Star Trek, Trek Beyond. Beyond. Okay, I, I actually don't know. Did it did it do pretty well? It underperformed. Did it? Um, and a lot of fans think it's the best of the the three. But that was sort of how I felt afterwards, although I'd have to see it again to to kind of make up my mind. Yeah. Well, we'll be covering each of those. Uh, yep. When we cover the Star Trek movies, be exciting. Uh, moving on to the next topic, I didn't find out about this until recently, but at uh, the Las Vegas convention that they have every year, mm -hmm. uh, for the last year in 2016, for the 50th anniversary, uh, they had a panel with with many of the actors from Star Trek including Scott Bakula, who played Captain Jonathan Archer on Enterprise. Mm -hmm. um, and somebody asked him if he was uh, possibly going to be involved in any way with Star Trek Discovery. And here's what he said. Uh, what I wanted to find out, or what I wanted to ask you, uh, with the new series coming out, would you be interested in reprising Archer if it was... Oh, absolutely. I, I, Brian and I were talking about this a couple weeks ago. And he tells the crowd, you know, not to go twittering or posting about it, but he, <laughs> he does say that him and Brian Fuller had a conversation about it. And I'll, I'll provide a link to, to this video so you can watch it in full, but he goes on to say that he's looked at some pictures from Discovery... Um, so Brian Fuller had kind of a semi-serious, at least, conversation with him. Right. He yeah. was showing him conceptual things. And Scott Bakula said the thing that will make it really easy to appear is that he is on the same network. He's on right. one of the NCI NCIS New Orleans. Okay. On CBS. Mm -hmm. So if he needed to work uh, Discovery into his schedule, it would be very easy to, to arrange. Mm -hmm. Um... Yeah, that was interesting. That was not just a, that was not a, oh, it'd be nice kind of thing. He was like, yup. <laughs> yeah, and then he says, yeah, me and Brian Fuller were just talking about that. 
And if you watch the video a little bit more, he goes on to say, <laughs> Calm down. Everybody calm down. It happens to be on the network that I'm on right now, so that's a good thing. Um, uh, but, uh, don't... Uh, people say that in our business all the time. <laughs> Love to have you on. Can't wait to work with you. He, see, he is... I am very, very excited about him helming this new franchise. I, uh, I did see some pictures of things that I can't talk about. I saw some images of makeup that I can't talk about. They were awesome. Yeah. If you know who's on the show, if you know who he is visually, times 10. That's all I'm going to say. So yes, I would love to be on it if, if, if asked, and uh, we'll see what happens. I can be on it. You can. Yes. That's fantastic. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. And that's kind of sad to hear now that we know that he won't be helming it. But, yeah. Um, maybe there's still a possibility for Scott Bakula to show up. Um, he would be very old. The, the, the Dr. McCoy style from uh, Encounter at Farpoint. And I, I would almost rather them do some kind of temporal Cold War time travel explanation. Sure. Uh, simply because I like the idea that's kind of official canon, it's kind of not, but it's just been suggested for the last decade or so. Captain Archer died in the year 2245 after the 1701 Enterprise launched on her maiden voyage. He died like the day after. Like He mm -hmm. lived long enough to see the next Enterprise, mm -hmm. and then he died. And <laughs> That's kind of cool. Yeah, know? yeah. It has a little bit of that feeling of kind of... Uh legendary uh, kind of a legendary quality to yeah, it. Yeah, he he lived long enough to pass the torch. Mm -hmm. uh, he's um he's he's also got some uh, some relatively youthful vibrance to him uh, still just looking at the, uh, the that clip there where uh, I I could see that um it it it'd be, it'd be decent to, enough to get him I I kind of like to see him at um at a younger age, and not all under a bunch of a ton of makeup, having to dollar yeah. around. Yeah, even when they do the makeup really good, it's still it's always it always feels a little off. It does it does? But um, that brings us to our last topic uh, as far as discovery news goes. Uh, we did know that there is a discovery novel in the works. It's going to be written by uh, David Mack, who's written a, a number right a lot of, of, of stuff. Star Trek books. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I can't remember if I've actually read anything from him. I feel like I must have. But I'm kind of hit and miss with what I've read in him. Well, he wrote the Vanguard series that I really want to read. I've just never gotten around to. Mm -hmm. What's um, that cover? It's like, he says he hates it when people describe it like this. But it's basically Deep Space Nine, but in the original series era. Okay. It's a space station um, that has a big galacto-political... Mm -hmm. uh, storyline going on on but it. Circa the original series. Yes. So you're dealing with like Klingons and and that type oh. of stuff uh, from from that. Shit, era. I need to read that too. <laughs> well, maybe we could do a series on on those books. I think there's five of them though, so it's a big commitment. Yeah, you know. But uh, his Star Trek Discovery book uh, has been titled Desperate Hour, which is very vague and tells us absolutely nothing. Yeah. Uh, Sometimes that's how they title them. But uh, it's supposedly coming out in January, uh, there is a uh, there is an option to pre-order it on Amazon, um, but that's not an official release date from uh, CBS licensing, so that is subject to change. Uh, we know it's not going to come out until after the show premieres, so probably just sometime in, in 2018 we can look forward to reading that. Mm -hmm. I kind of just want to pick this guy's brain, because he obviously knows a lot about Discovery's probably read the scripts and stuff, but let's get him on the show. We'll <laughs> Skype him in. Yeah, I think he lives in New York, so um, we'll. Uh, we have technology now. We can yeah, do these we'll, things. We'll see if, we're, if it's, we had a transporter, we could beam him down here to Texas. And it is, as it is, we'll have to set up a stuffed dummy and then uh, digitally uh, project his face onto it. That would work. Um, and it would look boss. <laughs> I don't know about that, but it would, it would look like something. <laughs> Uh, so that's that's pretty much all we have for Discovery. Uh, you have any uh, final thoughts on anything that we talked about? Um, nope. <laughs> no, no, um, I, you know, 
Uh, last week we talked about our, our fears, our, our, our trepidations about it. I'm I'm still feeling like some positivity towards this. I uh, it was the Jason Isaacs casting that did it. Yeah, maybe so. I, I you know I, I I think he he'll he'll be a, a bit of a powerhouse. Uh, you know, uh, uh, number one from uh, Walking Dead is going to have her work cut out for her not being overshadowed though with. You know the likes of uh, Isaacs and Michelle Yeoh and uh, and stuff uh, running around on the set. Um, now, how they film it, and you know how much screen time people are begin going to be getting, and whether the captain is portrayed as somewhat villainous or maybe like somebody who's uh, like you say, like Jellico, who maybe doesn't fit in with traditional Starfleet protocol and it has to be kind of overridden in some ways. You know that would that would be a, there. There could be a lot of things that would that would put her in the spotlight. And, and keep that from becoming a problem, but um, I do think that's you know that's a slight risk is the relative unknown up against the kind of the potent older actors you know like the equivalent of Patrick Stewart in the X Men movies and Ian McKellen they always kind of commanded it and you had to have a Hugh Jackman in there with a lot of screen time to uh, to kind of rein it in or hmm. you know. I talk about X Men a lot on here. Well, I like the X Men a lot. <laughs> I would actually say that the X-Men and uh, Star Trek were the twin poles of my pop cultural uh, awakening as a kid. So you're saying you want to uh, have uh, another podcast called Tex-Men. <laughs> yes, if we could. Uh, you know, just a few years ago, I read the novel that was the uh, X-Men Star Trek uh, crossover novel. Oh, God. And no, no, I thought it was pretty decently done. The comic that had come out in the nineties, okay. I thought, was weak. That's why. That's the only thing I read was the comic. Yeah, there was an actual novel. I um, I uh, I, I bought it for like uh, like ten cents or something through Amazon hmm. because I just wanted to know what the deal was. And in prose, where it got to breathe a little bit more, I felt that they got the characters down. It was really fun watching them kind of interact. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna give it a recommendation. Don't remember its name, but it's out there. Does it still have that? Uh, that gag where someone says Dr. McCoy and, and Beast and Bones both say yes at the same time? Uh, that was the best part about the comic, <laughs> but I don't know because I don't think uh, I don't think they had Beast uh, on this particular team. I think in some ways it was more of the traditional like 80s era team that like I kind of grew up with, which was, uh -huh. um, you know, Cla I think it was like Storm, Colossus, for sure Nightcrawler... Uh, maybe Kitty, Kitty Pride, um, Logan, Logan for sure. Um, I, I don't think it was too many people beyond that, but it was halfway decent. It was all right. Hmm. Well, mm, I'll Food probably not not read it, but I'm gonna bring it over next time. You can check it out. Uh, you, you, you can let it gather dust around here. But when you read a few pages, you'll want to know okay. more. Okay. I'll I'll uh, look into that and see if you're right or if you're mm -hmm. full of shit. Yeah, it's it's only fair. Well, what about I... you? Are you on the casting stuff? I'm pretty happy with uh, Jason Isaacs. I, I can't really comment on Mary Wiseman, but just from you know how she looks, the history she has, I think that's a good idea to have this very young woman mm -hmm. that has never been done in Star Trek before. You have this uh, this 20 year old young woman mm -hmm. um, straight out of the academy, and uh, so that's going to be unique. And uh, I assume that she has some acting chops if she's done all this uh, stage work and um, just came out of Juilliard. So yeah, uh, that's some, that's it looks some... like she got a lot of work in 2016 on TV. So people must, uh, must like her some for demand. some reason. You know, I, I, th I think I've talked, we've talked about this before, but I think that Will Wheaton uh, is a very talented actor. And like just a, a year or so before Next Generation came out was Stand By Me. And he was like really really amazing performance in that and i felt like the next generation didn't always tap into like kind of what he could do uh so i will i will hope for this younger actress uh that that she will get that kind of more meaty role that that he maybe didn't hmm. but and i will... like wesley crusher all right by the way i, just, I don't want to hate well we will talk more about that soon mm -hmm. uh, because the next episode of text trek will be a uh discussion on the Next Generation pilot yep. encounter at Farpoint. Right on. So uh, until then, live, live long, long and prosper, y'all. Thank all of you so much for checking out this installment of Text Trek. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, please be sure to like our YouTube videos and subscribe to our channel. 
Uh, Audio-only version of episodes are available at our website, www.text-trek.com. Uh, please check out our site, especially if you just want an audio-only podcast. Uh, we have that available for you. Y'all can also keep up with us online. You can follow us on Twitter, at TXTrek, or you can uh, check us out on Facebook at www dot facebook dot com slash text dash trek uh, please by all means let us know what you think by dropping a comment anywhere you see fit uh, we definitely want to hear your feedback let us know what you liked and what you would like to see more of what you would like to see differently going forward if you want to email me directly uh, go ahead I can be reached at fatheryactual at text dash trek dot com thank all y'all again take care